The only thing constant is change itself. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus said this statement in about 500 BC, and it remains true to this day, and is particularly familiar for those of us working in healthcare everywhere around the world and in the NHS in the UK. From bigger change uh, and reorganization of NHS structures, such as the introduction of integrated care systems, primary care networks, neighborhood teams, to getting used to the electronic consultation system uh, or the new way that a GP practice is going to run their on-call rotor. We all have to work with change and some of those watching, this video will be responsible for making change happen themselves. In this video, we will be exploring some change tools to help uh, take a team through change and hanging the thinking on the Cotter eight step change model. So let's get started. So John Cotter is an academic from the Harvard Business School uh, in uh, the United States of America oh, whoops, uh, and introduced his eight step change process in his 1995 book, Leading Change. I hope that we'll be able to do your work justice, Professor Cotter. Uh, this will be a quick introduction to the key concepts. So if you want to learn more and show some gratitude, then grab a copy of his book. Thanks, John. Link in the show notes. Uh, if you've ever been part of a group where someone is trying to influence change, then you may recognize some or all of these steps. Uh, a leader was probably trying to implement them as uh, part of taking your team through change with your group. Uh, learning about this framework can help you understand what's going on and play your part in a change process. And if you're leading change, then it can give you a way to break down the process and increase your chances of success. So what are the eight stages of the eight step uh, Cotter change model? Uh, well, I'm going to introduce them here in the video and then uh, we'll break them down in turn. So here they are. One, create a sense of urgency. Two, form a powerful coalition. Three, create a vision for change. Four, communicate the vision. Five, remove obstacles. Six, create quick wins. Seven, build on change. And eight, anchor the change in organizational culture. Uh, one of the first things that struck me um, here is that uh, this system lays out a lot of steps and it sounds like this will take a lot of time and resources to work through. Uh, is it worth all the efforts? Uh, I was asking myself. Uh, that being said, uh, when I was first involved in supporting change, it felt natural to me to uh, to just get on with it, um, just develop a workable solution and then tell people about it and um, expect them to understand and implement it. And as you might imagine, uh, this sometimes worked okay, uh, but often it didn't work too well and you didn't get a great amount of buy-in from people. Um, I think that this approach that I've just described does have its place for smaller, simpler changes, you know, inside organizations, within small groups, um, particularly when processes are being improved by people in positions of authority uh, with teams that are directly accountable to them. Uh, however, for more complex change involving different teams or across different organizations with varied needs, priorities, and vested interests, and when engaging with the change itself isn't an immediate or contractual requirement, I've seen this approach rarely work well, and leaders need something with some more structure, which I think uh, is where uh, Cotter's process and steps come in. Um, I do sometimes find myself and see other leaders drifting towards that tell people what to do model. Uh, and if this happens uh, when there is a, a heavy dose of time or other pressures uh, on a leader or team, uh, but it's really important that team leaders and maybe more importantly, those around them recognize that effective change requires the appropriate amount of time and energy and resources, and that this need will often be greater than you think. Uh, it's also definitely important to identify and involve those individuals in the organization that have a part to play in change. So really involve everybody that's that's needed. Um, all those people who will be able to influence success uh, by either engaging well or engaging negatively or not at all. Um, so assuming that we've made enough time and uh, made the resources available for change and identified those key stakeholder individuals and organizations, let's move on to Cotter's steps. So let's get started. Um, number one, create a sense of urgency. In order to change, people need to be motivated. People need to be aware of the information and the circumstances uh, that make change needed and necessary. But simply telling people the facts and the statistics and the edicts from above that make that change important isn't necessarily going to be enough. Uh, they need to engage with the material properly in order to process it and start to form their own ideas and justifications for change. Uh, a group discussing issues together uh, may also start to convince each other of the need for, for change as well. Um, so let's think about some ways uh, to achieve this. Uh, so steps might involve uh, bringing key people and organizations together. Face-to-face -face works best. 
um, uh, for this. And uh, food always helps uh, busy people come together uh, during uh, busy uh, lunch breaks and, and, and after hours. Um, I think it's important to present relevant information. Uh, so in UK general practice, this might be related uh, to uh, demographic issues and statistics, such as the aging population or local patterns of disease. Uh, the reality of coming funding or policy uh, changes represented by reports, white papers, uh, you know, other statistics and data, or new research and development in treatments and approaches that mean uh, that the management of conditions or populations need to change. Uh, it can also help to bring in other voices uh, from within the system or outside the system to uh, present and talk and give information uh, so that um, that urgency and that key information is heard uh, from others and not just um, the key individual individuals leading change. Um, we were going to introduce some tools as we went through this. So the first tool we're introduced here is the, uh, the SWOT analysis. So actually, I'm sure many people are familiar with this. Um, and this is a really uh, useful uh, tool, um, actually for producing actual output, but also for getting people to engage with the issues and information and making a start. Um, so uh, getting the key stakeholders to talk about the issues using some sort of framework like a SWOT analysis um, uh, can encourage people to you know, engage with that information, get on board, um, and also think about the positive elements of change. Sometimes people need to be guided towards uh, those uh, opportunities and strengths, uh, as well as dwelling on the negatives and the threats and the weaknesses. Uh, you know, opportunity can be a good motivator for change, uh, and also to do so with urgency, to, you know, to seize uh, the opportunities that can be in front of us. So that's step one. Moving on to step two, form a powerful coalition. Uh, one or just a small number of leaders alone uh, cannot implement change and cannot do so effectively. Uh, Cotter says that um, about 75% of an organization's management needs to buy into a change to make it possible. Uh, those figures may differ depending on the structure of the organization, but you need a, you need a lot of people on board and certainly more than just those those key people pushing uh, from the top. Um, and you know managing uh, change isn't enough. You know big and complex change needs uh, other people uh, as well as the leaders to also lead the change and not just be managed by those leaders. Uh, it's important to have a group of people on board who are emotionally committed to the change, you know and willing to go out there and lead and to use their influence on other people to get them on board. Uh, this group of people uh, ought to be representative of the different teams, groups, organizations, and individuals uh, in the organization. You need a broad team uh, to make this work. Um, and also remember that power comes from a number of places. You know, uh, job titles, yes, status, yes, technical expertise is important, uh, but also people's social influence within a team can be important. You know, sometimes there's a there's a receptionist who's is just really socially uh, respected and has a lot of social clout. And, you know, getting that person on board could be really key to getting a change to happen uh, within your GP practice, for example. So think carefully about who needs to be on board, who needs to form part of the coalition, more about uh, uh, that uh, later. Um, uh, this diagram uh, can be a useful way of uh, thinking about uh, getting people on board. Uh, this is part of the diffusion of innovation theory. So it's said that uh, people vary in their receptiveness to engage with new ideas and change along a normal distribution. And as change progresses uh, and becomes more proven and accepted and more established, more people adopt it. Um, those innovators, uh, those early adopters um, on the, the, the left hand side of the curve, uh, you know, can be used to convince the early majority. And you know, as people get on board, they convince and bring on board the people to the right of the slide. And some people say you know, the laggards, you know, they may never get on board, but they're not required for the critical mass for change. But you can try and you have to take accommodation of you know, what, they, what, what they think and, and, and uh, you know, how to support them to work within a new system. So that was two. Three, create a vision for change. Uh, so as the stakeholders and coalition engage with and discuss the drivers and factors related to change, a lot of ideas and a lot of solutions will begin to emerge. Uh, and it's important to capture those concepts, uh, explore them further and begin to categorize them and identify common themes, common values, common goals that are emerging. Um, the group will always come up with a more wiser, uh, a representative uh, bunch of suggestions than any one individual 
leader. Uh, and uh, this is really important to create a strong vision that everybody can feel ownership of, connection with, um, and get on board, you know, that they can see their influence and their ideas in the output. They will be more uh, motivated to advocate for it and to push it through. Um, wrapping all of this information up in a mission statement or vision statement um, can be hard. Um, and people sometimes switch off when you start talking about these things. But it is important to be able to briefly articulate what it is that you're trying to achieve, you know, in order to go out there, communicate the vision and get further support. Um, there's a lot of writing about creating visions and missions, um, but thinking about this in several layers I find can be helpful. So I think you need to articulate the key values shared by the group. Often that's one of the early or first steps. Um, a small number of sentences describing what the desired future looks like or how it will be, um, you know, can help crystallize a goal. Um, and then the main sort of projects and actions that will bring this about, the key headline features uh, of what you're going to do uh, will start to form an emergent strategy. Um, and I think you need to think about it in, in those layers really, and depending on the amount of time you've got to talk to people about it, you can kind of sit at, at the appropriate layer, given the time and resources and where that person is at. So the vision does need to be easily understandable and repeatable uh, by both the key leaders and other people getting on board. Everyone needs to understand it so that it can actually be used by the coalition to get further people in, uh, involved and on board. So next, once you've got the vision, you need to communicate the vision. Uh, people need to know about the vision in order for change to be successful. The message will have to uh, compete with day-to-day -day communications. You really do need a, a, a megaphone to get it out there. You know, if you're, uh, if you think you're communicating enough, then communicate more is what a lot of people will say. There's a lot of con competition for people's attention. So communicate frequently, powerfully, uh, and embed the message within the other activities and interactions that you're doing. If you're sending out emails, then you can often touch back and link things to the vision, or if you're giving, um, speeches or doing presentations, then saying a little bit about the vision and the overall aims of what's trying to be achieved can be really, really helpful. So it, it's not necessarily just to call special meetings, you know, talk about it um, uh, at all your meetings where it's appropriate. Um, although special meetings to talk about an advanced division obviously have their role. Um, so remember that the best communication, uh, you know, occurs in three di directions. Uh, people need to hear your message, uh, but you also need to listen to the feedback and respond to their concerns. And it's even better if people start talking to each other, you know, in that, that, that third layer of communication um, about the vision, about the change and about what's trying, trying to be uh, improved. So actually setting up systems and being permissive of people talking about the vision amongst themselves without you there is really, really important as well. Um, be prepared for a variety of responses from people, including negative reactions. Uh, so here's another tool that might be helpful to, uh, to think about, you know, negativity uh, or where people are at in their acceptance of change. So this is the Kubler-Ross change curve. Um, it can be a useful way to anticipate and expect a range of reactions from people towards a change, uh, particularly when it comes as a surprise, particularly when it is unwanted. Um, healthcare professionals out there will be most used to thinking about these uh, stages of change in terms of um, recognizing where people are and supporting people through grief reactions, for example, reactions to loss. Um, people move through or can be supported through uh, these stages. Um, and uh, you know, remember, they can occur at different times as well. They don't always occur in sequence. Uh, but, you know, recognizing where people are on this curve, you know, it can help you tailor support to them. This is a helpful diagram. If people are in denial, then, you know, focus on creating alignment. If people are frustrated, then, you know, maximizing communication, two-way communication, including listening to them. Where people are depressed, people maybe need the spark of motivation and pep talks. And, you know, as people start to move through to the more positive and growth-focused um, areas of the change curve, you know, you you can support experimentation and, um, you know, use that to develop creativity uh, and start to share, you know, knowledge as people move through decision taking uh, step and through to integration. So I think that is useful. And it's also a useful way for you to stay motivated, just just knowing that some people will get depressed by the change. Some people will be frustrated and some people will deny that it's happening. But in theory, these changes are temporary and people will move through them. So number eight, removing obstacles. 
Did I say number eight? I mean, number five, step five, removing obstacles. So hopefully you've created uh, a sense of a need for change. Hopefully you have uh, built buy-in from all levels uh, of your organization across the different stakeholders and you've uh, spoken to them and created a vision and you've got it, people talking about it and you're communicating the vision. Um, but what is, uh, <laughs> but it may, but that's not enough and um, it may not always work. You may start to find that you're coming across resistance, that you're coming across obstacles. Um, you know, sometimes these might be people working against change, but often they will be processes, lack of uh, equipment, lack of the correct uh, and right structures within an organization. Understanding what is or might work against change and removing obstacles will help your team execute the vision and to move forwards. Uh, you know, and sometimes there are positive forces that can be augmented and improved to help push your vision through. Um, so um, another tool that is useful and I would encourage people to look at is something called the, the Lewis force field analysis or the, the force field analysis. And that might be useful at this stage. So let's take a look. So on the left are arrows representing forces or factors for the change. And on the right are forces resisting change. Uh, the size of the arrow represents the strength of each force. So you can visualize that within this tool as well. And it might be helpful uh, to think about what these forces look like after you've taken reasonable actions to mitigate them as well, not just at their starting point. You can mitigate the negative resisting forces. And you can also augment the positive forces by taking action um, as well. Um, you can sort of add up the total volume of the arrows or the total scores. And some people would use this as a a tool for deciding whether or not a change is actually possible. Um, sometimes the mitigated opposing forces are just too great for the augmented encouraging forces, and it may not be you know, the right idea to go forward with that particular element of the change. That's number five. Moving on to number six, uh, create quick wins. So demonstrating success and achieving success is really motivating, and it helps bring more people on board with a process or change. Uh, by creating short-term targets uh, rather than far off distant longer-term goals you can give people something achievable to aim for uh, and provide a sense of success when it's achieved and you can do so in, in shorter time uh, periods uh, this also provides people with a feeling and evidence uh, supporting the strength of the overall vision and the overall direction of change which is really really helpful uh, remember also that failure is demotivating and uh, this can undermine people's belief in the overall project as well so being a little bit strategic about setting your really quick wins and your targets so that you know that they are achievable is an important tool an important factor to help you be successful uh, plan do act check cycles can be a useful way to help teams think about delivering simple and quick improvements, uh, you know, that support the values and the objectives of the overall change, but deliver a quick and tangible win. We're going to move on to number seven, building on change. Uh, Cotter believes that real change runs deep and that initial quick wins are only the beginning. Uh, there's a risk when an organization experiences success with initial projects, perhaps in key pinch point areas uh, that people might relax and lose momentum and lose that sense of urgency around the need for bigger uh, change that were built up and co-created in the earlier steps of the process. Uh, perhaps your GP surgery or primary care network put in place measures which took, pre which took pressure off patient access issues and everybody's feeling a little bit more relaxed. Um, but you haven't yet em uh, embedded uh, the culture of collaboration that you know you'll need to face future challenges you know this is a scenario that might lead people to um, lose focus on uh, the overall uh, sort of values and, and mission and change that you set out on um, to address this Cotter suggests that you might um, have a process of analyzing the wins taking stock of what's happened uh, learn what went well and then uh, also immediately think about what could be done better um, and you know use this as part of the process to refresh the goals, stretch existing goals, set new objectives as you go so that you're never really resting on your laurels. And I think this process leads into the eighth and final um, step, which is anchor change in organizational culture. Uh, so finally, uh, Cotter has some tips to embed change in corporate culture. Uh, he suggests that we talk about the progress, that we talk about it often. Um, change and the values and the mission and objectives that were created uh, in steps one to four you know remain really important so it's important to keep talking about them um, and to celebrate the success that you've been having by telling stories to demonstrate the effectiveness of the change and keep 
momentum. Um, recognizing key members of staff uh, and the original change coalition and their specific contributions uh, is really, really helpful. And those can be incorporated um, in these stories, in the success uh, narratives that you're telling around the change. Um, and also continue to use the mission and the values uh, that were created uh, and guided the initial change to guide key decisions in the organization on an ongoing basis, uh, such as about uh, which future projects to take on board or the direction of growth of the organization, you know, or when you're hiring new staff. And uh, some organizations will actually, um, in their structured project initiation documents or the documents they use to um, gather information and decide whether to green light projects or directions, will just have a have a step to check, you know, does this align with the stated visions? And that's a way to keep these visions alive and current. And 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 finally, it's important to have a proper process to refresh the values, refresh the missions, and keep them current and reflective of uh, the needs of the coalition and the environment that you're operating in. So it's important to incorporate annual or perhaps more frequent or perhaps slightly less frequent um, sessions to revisit steps, you know, one, two, three, and four to make sure that you uh, that the mission and the values are still delivering what's needed for the organization to be health healthy uh, change adapt uh, and meet the current and coming challenges uh, and very finally uh, just think about the people involved and um, and have a plan for succession of the key leaders and the key staff because it can be quite damaging if those people leave a project and there's no clear succession plan so that is and that was the Cotter eight step change model. Um, we also introduced a few of the tools and frameworks to help you think about change and move your organizations forward. We hope that that was helpful. Uh, and uh, if it was, uh, you might like some of our other videos uh, about change, technology, and policy in healthcare with a focus on the UK and a focus on the NHS. So uh, do, do share this video, do follow, like, subscribe, uh, and thank you for your time.